Okay. So um, the talks that we have today are related to embracing circularity, sustainable design, circular materials, and recycling innovations. We have again this time, we have three experts and in this field who will each of them also provide unique insights of the challenges and opportunities for implementing the circular economy. And our first speaker hmm, yeah, is Alicia Vallejo Olivares. Um, she's a research scientist uh, for the aluminum producer Nord Hydro. Uh, she's a graduate alumni for our uh, USMAT Coordinate AMAZE program. Um, she made a, a PhD in, in, in aluminum recycling um, at the Norve Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Um, and she also helped in the development of educational resources um, in, and software for material selection and sustainability. Um, her talk today um, is named Unlocking the Potential of Aluminium Recycling for Circularity and Industrial Research and Development Perspective. Um, our second talk is going to be given uh, by Rashid Haku. Um, he is Professor of Higher Education at Kadi Ayat University in Morocco. Um, he's working in mining, yeah, so, uh, he is part of the, of the Cathedra of Mining Environment. He has a doctorate in, in geoscience uh, and raw materials uh, from the University of Lorraine. He also has a PhD um, in waste management and treatment uh, from the um, Faculty of Science of Technology in Marrakech. He has also different working areas, uh, like for example, the valorization of mine waste as an alternative aggregate for construction materials. Um, and he also was part of different or diverse projects um, as an example of the management and stabilization of industrial and mining waste um, to the durability of concrete and bricks from phosphate um, mine tailings. Um, and the talk he's going to give today is called Recycling of Mine Wastes as Raw Materials in the Construction Sector Towards a Smart Circular Economy. And our last talk today is going to be given by Alexandre Nomine. Um, he is an associate professor at the University of Lorraine, and he's also head of the School of Mine International Office. Um, he's also head of Her Ross Project, uh, which focuses in raw material sustainability for green and digital uh, transitions. Um, the, his research areas, um, it's focused in, in the integrates of aluminum, into non-equilibrium nanoparticle synthesis for sustainable materials. And he also oversees the Green Nano European Master Program. And the talk um, is called Sustainable Materials by Design for the Green and Digital Transition. So as Flavio mentioned, um, after our first talk, we are going to have yes, so a um, very short yes, so a question um, round, uh, but the, for the other two, we are going to have the question and discussion at the end. So um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Alicia, you can. Um... Yes. Um... Uh, uh, no, I. Okay, yeah, I can also take over. I think. Can you? Okay. Right. Yeah. Can you see my screen? It's not, in see? Mode, not in presentation mode. Yes, now. Now, okay. Thank you so much for the introduction. Yes, I, I will have to to leave and then I will still try to follow uh, from my phone, but I will be on the way to the airport, but I will try to stay online because I'm interested in the in the other talks of the discussion, but it's best to take the questions after the presentation just in case the connection will not be good. Um, yeah, I had a, a short introduction here as well, uh, just wanted to mention a, a bit uh, my inspiration to uh, start a PhD in the topic of aluminum recycling was actually uh, starting by reading this book while I was uh, living in Cambridge. It's called Sustainable Materials with Both Eyes Open. Um, and uh, yeah, this inspired me about the, the need that we have to, to produce sustainable ma materials and the possibilities which 
aluminum recycling is offering. And uh, today I will show I will share with you a little bit the um, the importance of uh, aluminum recycling, some uh, overview of the recycling process, some definitions, um, and also reflect on the potential for cir circularity. Since recycling and circularity is to different uh, levels. And then I will share some of the activities that we are working on in the R&D team in Hydro. So this is where I'm currently located. It's uh, on the fjords of Norway in uh, Sundalsora. It's Europe's uh, largest uh, primary aluminum smelter. But uh, Hydro is present in 40 countries and we have both primary smelters but also multiple recyclers for example in in Germany in Spain in Poland in the US and actually uh, here we have the number of the tons of uh, post consumer uh, scrap from that uh, was recycled in hydro in 2023 but the plan is to at least double or even triple this number by 2030. So we have a lot of investments now okay, and exciting developments in the recycling area. And why is uh, this? Of course, we have as well ambitious targets to reduce the CO2 footprint in our products by 30%, by 30%. 2030 and zero emissions by 2050. And uh, now we already produce some of the lowest uh, CO2 footprint um, primary aluminum of the market that is branded as Reduxa with a CO2 footprint of four uh, kilo per kilo aluminum. Uh, and we also have some products with uh, at least 75% post-consumer scrap in the branded as Circal. So just to illustrate the benefits of recycling aluminum compared to primary production, I have this um, diagram that shows the different stages in the life cycle of aluminum products. So, um, and now, uh, if we look at the global um, um, greenhouse emissions generated by the aluminum industry, and we break this down by each of these stages, then we can see that uh, mining bauxite and then refining through the budget process into alumina generates significant amounts of CO2 equivalent, then reducing the alumina into aluminum is, of course, a very energy intensive process. The uh, production of anodes, and then we have as well other processes like remelting scrap, casting, the uh, sh uh, shaping the, the aluminum into um, semi products like extrusion billets, yeah. and then uh, finally into products, and then collecting, treating, and remelting the scrap. If we go through the recycling route and directly source the aluminum in the post-consumed scrap, then we could omit these steps, which looking at the global numbers of uh, greenhouse emissions, we could uh, reduce is uh, by 93%. So we would be able to skip this, looking at the global numbers. Of course, then we have to keep in mind that it matters where and how the aluminum is produced. As I mentioned, this, uh, the electrolysis mainly is a very highly uh, energy intensive process. And of course, one of the main reasons why the aluminum produced in Norway has a lower CO2 footprint and also the therefore the European average 
is uh, relatively lower to the global average of the CO2 footprint per kilogram of aluminum is uh, the re renewable energy that we have available, uh, the hydropower. So then, uh, but still, here is our um, lower CO2 footprint uh, um, carbon primary, primary aluminum reduction. And we still uh, would benefit if we compare uh, with the, with a hundred percent post consumer scrap uh, product, uh, we would reduce it uh, significantly still. So adding uh, post consumer scrap into the products is definitely one very important strategy into uh, lowering the CO two footprint and reaching uh, neutrality. So let's have a quick look into the aluminum recycling processes. Always we have to uh, have in mind that first of all, you need to collect the aluminum products and to separate the aluminum from the other materials in the waste stream. This uh, we should not take for granted. So, but then um, there are certain steps to prepare the aluminum scrap for melting. This can include shredding, sieving into different sizes, and also um, depending on the type of scrap and the level of contamination and the type of furnace that is available, sometimes it's possible to heat up the, the scrap in order to burn off the moisture and the organics present. This is known as a thermal pretreatment. And then aluminum is melted at around 700 degrees Celsius. And these are, I would classify the furnaces that we use into two main uh, processes. One is uh, this one, um, what would be a, a basically, if this is um, a reverberatory furnace, here we can see the cross section. It's basically an aluminum swimming pool and the molten aluminum then has um, a layer of dross that is a mix of aluminum oxide that aluminum always oxidizes in contact with uh, the atmospheres, but then this layer is removed and is a waste product that is possible to, to treat. And then we have uh, another, the second alternative that would be using rotary furnaces that we have the cross section here and use um, significant amounts of salt fluxes. Uh, and this method is more common for a scrap that is contaminated, that has not been uh, decoded, or a scrap that contains a um, relatively high amount of oxides since the salts help removing and separating the oxides from the metal. Then the melt treatment uh, steps can include uh, the gassing with the uh, argon gas uh, or to, to remove the non-metallic contamination like oxides and the, the hydrogen and filtration. And then finally handling the residues that depending on the route would be dross in this case or a product called salt slack. Uh, salt cake uh, or, or salt slack in these other routes. Um, in Europe, the, of course, its landfill is uh, forbidden and there are processes to, to treat these waste products and re recycle uh, them back into the process or into other applications. For example, uh, some of the oxides from the salt slack can be uh, used uh, for uh, construction. And when we look at the uh, recycling rates, usually the recycling rate um, is uh, defined as the ratio of end of life products that is delivered to an effective recycling process. While recovery rate um, is uh, the ratio of end of life products that is recovered from waste stream, but um, 
this can also include, uh, for example, the energy recovery. So for example, when we discuss recycling rates, we should um, understand where the numbers come from. And is the, for example, um, waste to energy incineration is is it included in this number or is it actually the materials are actually being recycled and then on top of that we have the efficiency of the recycling processes themselves we often discuss this uh, as metal yield that is the ratio of metal that we can produce per input of the weight of the scrap so if we treat one ton of scrap maybe we have a metal yield of 800 kilograms of aluminium because there might be organic materials oxides as well in the scrap and another important um, aspect uh, when we discuss definitions and recycling efficiencies and the CO2 footprint of uh, materials is to know if we are discussing the recycling of post-consumer scrap or the recycling of pre-consumer scrap. There is a discussion, some actors in the aluminum industry do not differentiate between post-consumer scrap or that is coming from end-of-life products that has been, have been disposed after being used or pre-consumer scrap that is generating, generated during the production processes. Um, so it has never had a useful uh, life and in practice is an inefficiency of the process. And uh, when it comes to accounting the CO2 emissions in hydro, we make a difference when we are discussing um, recycling of post-consumer scrap, then we consider that the, the CO2 um, is, uh, should, that should be accounted, should be accounted is only the one from the treatment and the recycling and processing of the scrap. But if we are uh, remelting processed scrap, then we still count the CO2 of the mining process or of the electrolysis process as well. And this of course, may, of course makes a very big difference um, when discussing CO2 footprints and the influence of recycling. And now let's uh, move into circularity. Is it, um, can we talk about circularity when um, discussing um, aluminum? In theory, yes, aluminum has definitely a potential for circularity, which uh, my definition is that we recycle the aluminum and we keep its value. So we use an uh, aluminum scrap to fabricate a product of similar value. But in order to be able to do so, we need to meet these two um, conditions that they, we need to keep the chemical composition of the alloy. Of course, we aluminum alloys have alloy, different alloy elements and this should be uh, met and also the quality of the map that there are no not uh, inclusions like oxides, carbides, or other non-metallic non uh, products. Um, we do have good processes with regards to melt cleaning less, uh, for example, uh, ceramic filters to secure the quality of the melts even when we melt post-consumer scrap. And the main challenge for us that uh, I would like to discuss today is the chemical composition of the alloys. Um, these are the two main types of aluminum alloys, grot alloys and cast alloys. Um, grot alloys are uh, shaped by uh, thermomechanical uh, 
uh, processes. For example, uh, you see the rolling or extrusion could be included while cast alloys are shaped by <clears throat> uh, introducing the liquid metal into a mold. This is what it gives the shape. And the main difference is that cast alloys have typical, typically much higher silicon content and much higher concentrations of alloying elements. So it's a little bit like having a pure dark chocolate, That's, that would be our growth alloys. And uh, Kit Kat that has also milk, that has also cookies. So we have also silicon, copper. Of course, there are many different alloys, but simplifying, if we mix uh, this dark chocolate and this Kit Kat, then if we want to produce again the pure chocolate, the growth alloy, one alternative is to dilute using primary alum aluminum. Um, and the other alternatives, we cannot use this mix for the purest alloy, but we can downgrade the mix and produce this uh, product, uh, the cast alloy, by then adding extra alloying elements. So these are the strategies that have been um, used typically in the aluminum industry to deal with the fact that the different products are mixed together and each of these products have a different uh, alloy. And at the end, it's also possible to use some aluminum as the oxidation in the steel industry, but then of course the aluminum is oxidized and, and lost uh, during this process. So what happens then is that um, if we look at this diagram from a research uh, paper, we see that most of the old scrap is used for uh, cast alloys and mostly for automotive industry. And traditionally, uh, one of the main applications has been uh, combustion engines. So this is um, not really circularity, it's recycling, but we have a downgrading of the quality of the growth a lot pro uh, products into secondary foundry alloys. So it is, it makes sense, but it's not the optimal solution. And maybe according to this research paper, paper, they were discussing, there might be a surplus in the future of low quality aluminum scrap. Of course, this is just an incognita, but we are working to try to improve this scenario and try to keep the value of growth alloys into growth alloys. And um, one of the challenges as well is that in the automotive industry, for example, that is um, one of uh, the sectors where we are um, producing uh, our products uh, for, there are uh, developments such as the um, mega and giga castings of car components. Instead of casting many different parts now, there is a trend to cast very large and complex pieces that also have structural requirements and these have uh, higher purity requirements. So this is also pushing, pushing us and the fact that the combustion engines demand will be expected is expected to decrease. So we need to be able to use the post-consumer scrap into high purity aluminum alloys as well, not only into secondary foundry alloys for combustion engines. So now I'm going to share a little bit we are doing in the R&D department in Hydro, both in Sundalzora and our colleagues in the, in Dormagen and Bonn in Germany, where I am actually now at the moment visiting. So we are trying to increase the use of post-consumer scrap into high value alloys, high purity alloys. We are doing this from two approaches. First of all, to optimize the sourcing of the scrap, the different types of scrap and the sorting and the scrap pre preparation for, for remelting and also to understand how the 
different elements influence the final properties of the products and discuss the possibilities of potentially expanding the specifications of these higher end alloys so that they can also take a higher uh, percentage of post-consumer scrap. Currently, there is some circular aluminum that we are producing. Uh, this is what I mentioned earlier, branded as Circal. Uh, Hydro has several plants producing this with at least 75% uh, post-consumer scrap. Here we have the average composition of this alloy um, from the environmental product de declaration. And um, this is mainly used for construction and the source of the scrap is also mainly uh, coming from construction. And how this is um, being achieved is how circularity is being achieved in this case is by securing the cleaning less of the melt by the retreatment of the scrap that contains cutting, uh, cold contamination and also by uh, advanced sorting. And this is a simplified uh, sorting process where the scrap first of all is shredded and um, sift into the right uh, sizes for further sorting. Then ferrous metals are removed by a magnetic sorter. Uh, an eddy current, current separator is uh, um, separating the conda electrically conductive materials from non-conductive like aluminum, glass, uh, like um, plastic glass. And then an X-ray sorter is able to separate heavy metals like copper and zinc by um, based on the difference of the um, X-ray ab absorption due to the different atomic density of these elements. And here in, uh, in the plant that we have in St. Peter in Germany, they have an even more advanced uh, sorting uh, leaves sorter that is based into um, measuring the specific chemistry of each piece by um, reading the spectra genera generated by a laser pulse, and then is able to make a decision and sort into different families of alloys or groups of alloys. We are also testing different types of scrap and discussing what is the right sorting process for each type of scrap in order to meet the different products that we have. And then in the, for example, in the laboratory in Sundasora, we do some smaller scale tests like this one, where we were testing scrap coming from the automotive industry, from shredded cars, and trying to use it for a um, primary foundry alloy use for the automotive industry as well. And this is an example of typical specifications that we have in a primary foundry alloys. They are quite strict in iron and copper, and this is present in the post-consumer scrap. So we calculated we could add up to 20% of this type of scrap, but then if going higher to 30%, we would be going outside of the specifications. So we are um, just trying to understand how to either improve the sorting process or how understand how this increased um, um, con concentration of elements would affect the properties of the final products. And just to show that we have uh, some partnerships with the, the automotive uh, industry, since they also have very ambitious targets to reduce the CO2 footprint of their products. And we are really uh, working together with them to understand how to increase both the uh, recycling content of post-consumer scrap and also the circularity, if possible, sourcing the materials in the um, scrap from the automotive industry in some cases.
this is just the, the summary of what I have covered and I'm happy to answer some questions. Thank you very much, Alicia, for, for your presentation um, from this very interesting topic. Okay, good, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, first and uh, foremost, I would like to express my gratitude to the organizing committee of this webinar for the invitation. A special thanks to Flavio for the opportunity for this opportunity to share with you some results and some outcomes of our research here in 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 Morocco. Following is the uh, sorry uh, is the plan of uh, my presentation. First, I will provide an overview of mining activities and uh, the challenges for the mining industry in general. And then I will uh, highlight some, uh, yeah, some, I will, I will present some findings of our, from our research on recycling and mine waste, uh, just to give you some examples that uh, we have, uh, yes, we are in progress here in, uh, in Morocco and I will, uh, finally give some conclusion and perspectives. Uh, Chilean and the, sorry, I will. Uh, Chilean and West Rock are the two types of materials generated during mining operations. There are uh, West Rock, West rock refers to the materials generated during mining operation and is uh, typically uh, Gabriela Moreira Lana a quitté removed, la réunion removed to assess the ore body and uh, it does not contain economically significant uh, minerals tailings are the finely ground rock particles left over the valuable min minerals through mineral processing. Moyenne uh, lua a quinte de quitter la réunion. After, uh, yes, after crushing grinding to produce concentrate, we produce tailings. For example, as uh, mentioned by Alicia, when, pro when we produce aluminium uh, from bauxite, we produce large volumes of Samsung uh, SMS 908 UA called the uh, red mode. Uh, the green uh, energy trans transition relies on raw materials from mine, uh, essential for some technologies uh, like batteries or uh, fuel cells or wind uh, turbines. Uh, yeah, critical raw materials face supplies risks with demand for lithium, graphite, and cobalt, for, for example, for the, uh, the in energy storage. And uh, they expected to scale rocket by 2015. Uh, shortage of copper, graphite, and germanium treating case sectors like renewable immobility and defense. So, for example, the world supply can't afford 20 times increase in lithium demand in only eight years and uh, uh, 55 times for the next uh, uh, 20 years. That, that means that uh, for the green energy transition, we need large quantities of uh, materials, large quantities of metals, and these uh, uh, metals are coming from mining, and uh, uh, they will produce large quantities of uh, mine waste. Uh, mining generates between 50 to 1,000 billion tons of waste annually, 
including tailings and waste stock. This volume is expected to rise or grades decline. The graphs present actual and projected volumes of mining waste for copper, for nickel, and for lithium from 2020 to 2050. A rising global demand of copper and nickel is fueled by their critical roles in renewable energy system. Tealings are in these graphs are uh, presented in blue and we stroke in orange. They show a clear trend with stroke consistently exceeds tealings in volume, reflecting the scale of uh, modern mining operation. Uh, since 2022, tealings and West Rock production have grown significantly with projection showing sharp increases throughout 2050. According to the USGS, uh, uh, over 217 billion cubic meters of tealings are currently in storage highlighting the need for uh, sustainable uh, waste management strategies. Uh, to address the environmental and economic challenges posed by mining waste, our team focuses on uh, circular economy principle. One uh, inspiring model come from Sweden where uh, companies uh, like uh, LKAB and Bulletin recycle mining waste to produce uh, valuable added products such as pirate concentrate, uh, which is roasted to produce iron oxide and uh, uh, apatite is uh, mixed with sulfuric acid coming from pyrite to, produ to produce uh, uh, phosphoric acid. And also, uh, yes, these uh, uh, plants produce uh, from, uh, as byproduct, gypsum, uh, rare earth element, and fluorine fl production. Green hydrogen is uh, integrated in, uh, into ammonia production contributing to mineral fertilizer manufacturing. This uh, process showcases the integration of uh, green technology and the resource recycling to create sustainable production from mining by, by product. This, uh, yeah, this is uh, yes, our approach, uh, our inspiration in our uh, research work in our research team. Uh, sorry. Uh, this slide highlights the dominant role of construction materials and global resource consumption. Construction materials dominate global resource, resource uh, consumption in the world, according for 49%. For total material used in uh, 2017, demand is projected to, to double from uh, 79 uh, billion tons in 2011 to 167 in uh, by uh, 2016. The sector's uh, vast annual consumption underscores the need for sustainable practice such as recycling mining waste to meet grow demand. This uh, that means that uh, mine waste could be used or inert mine waste could be, could be used uh, as construction and building materials to replace some uh, uh, natural aggregates such as uh, gravel, clay, limestone, and uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, maybe uh, other other materials. Uh, inert mining waste offers a valuable solution, serving as a substitute for natural resources like sand, gravel, and limestone. At uh, Kadiad University, in collaboration with the uh, University Mohammed VI Polytechnic in Benigrir, our research demonstrates how Chilean and West Rock can be 
proposed for construction materials, uh, promoting a closed loop system. This concept, yes, reflect our research approach de de developed by, by our team. In uh, general, it is uh, important to note that not all main wastes are hazardous or dangerous. We conduct leaching tests to assess the mobility of uh, toxic elements within waste materials, and then we categorize them uh, depending on the results of leaching as hazardous or no hazardous or inert. We, yeah, the, if uh, mine waste contain large quantities of sulfide, they, they could be considered as uh, dangerous because they, they generate acidity. If there is no sulfide in the mine waste, they can be considered as, uh, as, uh, as inert. And uh, now I will uh, present to you our research result on uh, Jarada coal mine situated in the northeast of, uh, of um, in Morocco. It is, it is one of the most problematic sites in Morocco because there are more than uh, 80,000 people living uh, close to this uh, um, mine west. The domain is closed in uh, uh, 2001. It produced uh, large quantities of coal. And uh, when the site is closed, more than 15 million tons of coal waste near the town are, are stockpiled. Currently, the government and local authorities plan to transform this mine site into mining mesogical park and uh, also the industrial park for the valorization of, of coal waste. It is a well-documented uh, mine site in, in Morocco. And, uh, yeah. and uh, our approach to valorize uh, this uh, mine waste, we uh, first perform some drilling to have uh, representative samples. And then we characterize the, the materials, the waste, and we investigate the chemical behavior on the remaining carbon content and sulfur using 3D block models and uh, to propose the guidelines for reprocessing. We, uh, yeah, we, we, uh, we, we performed more than 25 drillings and we collected more than, uh, yeah, more than uh, uh, five, hundred samples that uh, are being an analyzed using um, chemical and mineralogical uh, analysis. The coal main waste piles are rich in carbon with concentration up to 20%. And uh, yeah, the, the mineralogical includes Clays, uh, quartz, muscovite, and uh, minor amounts of albite, uh, oncarite, and gypsum. Uh, pirate oxidation suggests high iron levels, and carbon liberation is moderate, poor, ranging from 23 to 32%. And, uh, sorry, yeah, and then we, have estimate the coal uh, which uh, still in this uh, in in this pile the 3d modeling approach estimated the total residual coal resource of uh, uh, 12 million tons in the in the in the area that that means that coal is still is still yes is still important in this uh, main waste and uh, our approach is to produce uh, bricks to produce fired clay bricks. It's a mixture of uh, clay, sand, and water. The use of additive as has an objective depending on the final product as to, to adjust. So you, we, we need alumina to adjust plasticity and silica to uh, have uh, orbitrication and uh, to have uh, uh, 
higher top 10, higher resistance. And uh, some uh, alkaline and alkaline air, earth oxide are added to, uh, yes, to have, uh, to, to increase the temperature of, uh, of, uh, of firing. That means that coal in this blue area, we see that we can produce bricks from coal waste. So this slide presents the sustainable use of coal mine waste to produce uh, eco-friendly fired uh, clay bricks. Uh, the results include you improve brick quality after coal rem uh, removal using flotation. We can, yeah, we can uh, obtain coal with high content of, of carbon after uh, flotation using fuel and uh, uh, as collector and uh, methyl is methyl as a uh, floater. We recover an over, uh, sorry, 60% of the reserve coal. And uh, when we uh, produce bricks, depending if it is in, in bricks uh, without, uh, with the high content of carbon or after flotation, we see that, uh, yeah, that uh, the mechanical properties when uh, with the bricks with less carbon is very high because the porosity is very is, is very low, and if we produce bricks mixed with coal, yeah, we have uh, uh, high uh, plutonium uh, so, sorry uh, uh, lower uh, mechanical strength. However, it it exceeds the the, the, the standard. The leaching test showed that heavy metals leaching, uh, yeah, where the, the bricks are, are safe and there is no heavy metals or uh, any toxic element in the in, in the in the leaching at during the use of uh, bricks or at the end of, of life after after construction. Yeah. Uh, according to to the results of this study, two main scenarios may be proposed to best manage the coal main waste in a sustainable and, uh, and efficiency way. The first scenario consists of the production, the production sorry, of, the, of two values of added potential product, fine coal, and uh, high, uh, yes, and uh, concentrate and high mechanical strength bricks. Also, we can, yeah, we can use uh, this uh, coal waste rock as uh, uh, raw materials to produce, uh, um, yeah, to, to produce concrete or, or other, or other uh, construction materials, such as geopolymer or cement. The selection of the optimal scenario will be governed by technical and economical and environmental parameters that are under uh, studies. The, other part of our research is dedicated to the phosphate uh, mine waste. Morocco processes over 72% of the world's phosphate rock reserves. And uh, yeah, Morocco is uh, the leading exporter of phosphate in, 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 the, in the world. The phosphate ore is extracted from open pit mines through drilling and blasting. It contains high level of glyce and, uh, and uh, carbonates, and it is transported to the beneficiation plant to produce phosphate concentrate after flotation and, uh, and, and washing plant. And then the phosphate con con uh, concentrate is transported to the chemical treat uh, treatment to produce sulfuric acid. And then the phosphate is mixed to, to sulfuric acid to produce phosphoric acid, which is the starting point for the production of various fertilizer. In uh, 2020, the global waste rock generated by phosphate mining exceeds 1 billion tons. That means that uh, the quantities are, are, very, are very, very important in the, in, the, in the world. In the case of some mindset in, in, uh, in Morocco, we have uh, yeah, uh, estimated that more than 1,000 million tons per year of uh, 
where stroke is, is generated by the main site in, in Morocco. And uh, these uh, materials are, are mixed, Mars, uh, limestones, flint, silicate, they, they are mixed and they are considered as main waste and stored all around the main stock pit. The, uh, yeah, this, uh, the main environmental application of this uh, uh, straight waste rock, dams and piles, uh, yeah, consists of uh, the, yeah, the, the huge footprints and uh, of, the, of the main area, they modify topography and they uh, disfigure the landscape and also they reduce Arab lands. And yeah, it's a, it's a serious problem in terms of, of storage capacity for, for the mining company. The withering test through kinetic test showed that uh, there is no significant contaminant from the phosphate limestone, given, uh, yes, because they contain high quantities of, 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 of carbonate and the leachate showed that negligible levels of trace elements such as uh, copper, arsenic, uh, lead, iron, and other are, are very, 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 very low. That means that uh, these materials are inert. They, yeah, they, 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 there is no any issue in terms of, uh, of uh, heavy metals pollution. In uh, our approach, we can consider that natural ag aggregates coming from massive rock quarry, which consists of uh, uh, crushing, to do all uh, yeah, uh, uh, techniques, the, 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 the same techniques used for massive rock quarry are similar to, the, to, to the those used in phosphate mine. To, yeah, to have phosphate ore, we, yeah, we used, this is why we can, uh, yeah, we can uh, consider the phosphate mine is equivalent to the massive uh, rock query. At uh, M6P and uh, Kadia University, we are working in the transformation of this uh, of this waste to the uh, yes novel high value added materials. The team researched recycling and secondary use application of this uh, waste rock to produce uh, calcinide. Uh, Clays, or uh, to produce fired and compressed bricks, also to we have uh, uh, yeah uh, perform some studies to produce concrete, geopolymer, and uh, we can use some uh, yeah some uh, waste rock as uh, alternative aggregate for road uh, construction. Very encouraging results were obtained at the laboratory level and also at uh, the, the pilot scale level. A large number of uh, uh, PhD students received advancing training throughout the program. Already six of them have defended their, uh, their thesis. Uh, maybe this is the, yeah, the, in, I will uh, share with you this, uh, this uh, result because in my opinion, we can say that the best way of valorization with low carbon footprint consists of use of phosphate was rock as raw materials to produce eco-friendly and uh, low cost construction materials as compressed and stabilized bricks. We need just to mix the, the Swiss rock with the 10% of red clay and 10% of cement we add water and with the Hydraulic press, we can produce some bricks. And uh, yes, we have uh, demonstrated that uh, these bricks are meets, meet the, 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 the standard. And the objective, the final ob objective for us is to improve housing condition for uh, village communities, particularly those living near phosphate uh, mine. Yes, this uh, yeah we can uh, yeah, in, improve this uh, housing using the the, the waste rock to produce bricks, yeah, 
and this uh, uh, yeah this uh, this is our our main goal for this uh, project and maybe yeah uh, we can conclude I can conclude that circular economy is not about uh, one manufacturer changing one product yeah we uh, we can uh, use some waste rock and some tailings coming from mining as uh, yes as uh, secondary raw materials for uh, construction sectors and uh, yeah thank you all for your patient attention thank you Thank you, Rashid, for your presentation. And um, now we just will, uh, welcome Alexander, Alexandre, yes, so yes, for his presentation. And at the end, yes, so we have a round of questions and, and comment discussions. Please, okay. you are uh, free to thank share. You. I'm gonna just share my screen. Uh, okay. Okay, should work. Let me know if it. Doesn't. It's working oh. perfect. All right. Okay. So uh, thank you very much for, uh, for for the organizing team for inviting me. So and uh, I will close this uh, webinar with uh, some insight into sustainable materials by design. And I will actually start with my with my take home message because so the, therefore I will repeat it twice. Um, well, once again, when we speak about mining, when we speak about materials, when we speak about sustainability. Sometimes there is a false feeling that uh, we mine out of pleasure, or sometimes even if we listen to some journalists just to voluntarily uh, destroy the planet. Well, no, that's not true. And basically, uh, if we do mining, it means there is a demand. And to respond in this demand, some people like us have found the materials that fit a metal, which means that if you take the problem in the other side, it means that if we take into account sustainability from the creation of a product, we can influence the demand and which materials will be mined more and which will be less. So let me explain a little bit this point over the next 20 uh, minutes. So I hope everyone understands uh, right now that um, the green and digital transition um, will go will be associated with a spectacular increase in materials demand, this is what Professor Haku was just saying in the previous talk, he was showing very telling graph about this. We will need more materials, we will need more metals. So while we are going to green transition, we shift from a dependency into fossil, which is a non-renewable uh, resource to a metal dependence and metals are not uh, renewable as well. Uh, so we should uh, not repeat the mistake that we did with oil with metal by thinking that the resources are infinite and the exploitation is neutral. Even solar energy, solar energy in itself is green, but the way to transform them requires solar cells and the production of solar cell and of silicon is not something neutral. And here we have, as material scientists, uh, our role to play. So we are extremely dependent on materials. And as I say, extracting metal is not neutral. Uh, it has an impact on the environment. Uh, we saw the previous, uh, the previous two talks explain what is the impact and how we work on, on mitigating it. Um, we also need to wonder, um, do we have enough of the materials that uh, we need for this transition. And finally, I would like to draw your attention on the fact that many materials that we are working with are actually byproducts, which complexifies uh, quite much um, the question of the supply. Just let's have a look. I mean, I know if there is, I know the previous, Professor Haku is a geologist, so he may not like this graph because it's extremely simplistic. However, it's good to have some order of magnitude in mind. Um, when you talk about abundance of materials, you can have a fact, uh, 12 order of magnitudes uh, in, in, in abundance, so a factor of 1,000 billion, right, between the most abundant materials and the rarest one, uh, which are in the platinum group metals, uh, like iridium or osmium. And if you compare the production of those metals, so this is the, this is the abundance in earth crust, 
which does not mean that it uh, corresponds exactly to the reserves and or to the production. This is slightly different, but anyway, uh, we understand that we have quite much silicon available, iron, magnesium, titanium, manganese. This is what we call rock forming elements. Uh, however, iridium, rhenium, osmium, platinum are extremely rare. Just to give you an example, we produce approximately 500 to 1000 kilograms of osmium per year for the whole earth, right? So this is not something for mass market. Um, and today, for example, for the hydrogen economy, we produce seven tons of iridium. So when you remember that iridium density is around 20, this is a third of a cubic meter. So basically um, the, the, the world production of iridium would fit in a cupboard. And it's a strategic problem to rise this production from seven tons to 12 tons. So hydrogen economy will just generate the need for five more tons of iridium. This is ridiculous in terms of volume. This is extra small. It could fit under my chair. Um, however, this is a huge problem and this is a few billion euros problem. Right, but because actually uh, we can cope with economy, but uh, we cannot always cope with earth, right? There is the metals, there is the reserves that they are on earth and there's nothing we can do with that. This is why we need material scientists that are extremely innovative to substitute those type of materials. And metals are not equal. They are not equal in terms of abundance and they are not equal in terms of their impact. Um, you all heard, I mean, you are material scientists, so you all heard about the fact that iron um, iron industry has to decarbonize. We had a very good talk before about aluminum, also about reducing the CO2 footprint. Well, you might be surprised, but actually iron is the cleanest one per unit of mass. This is as surprising as it might be. Uh, one kilogram of, uh, of iron produces two kilogram of CO2. Uh, one kilogram of gold, which would fit in an espresso cup, produced 50 tons of CO2. So just basically per unit of mass, iron is, is, is the cleanest. Um, however, it is the mostly produced. This is why finally, if you do the integral, iron is responsible for 8% of the CO2 footprint of the humanity. So the cleanest one per unit of mass, but produced massively, generates the number one polluter in the planet. But gold is, of course, we don't produce that much gold, approximately 3,000 tons a year, but one kilo of gold will be 50 tons of CO2. This is just like traveling 10 times around the globe by plane. If you just calculate, I mean, one, uh, I mean, um, it will be 60,000 euros uh, for gold approximately. So probably with 60,000 euros, you can do 10 times around, travel 10 times around the globe by plane if you find any uh, use in that. So you see there is some kind of a uh, consistency, but we should very much, once again, very much have this in mind. Gold is not extremely, is almost useless, I would say, uh, for the green and digital transition, but platinum is not. Platinum is extremely important for hydrogen economy and has a very similar CO2 footprint. So if you substitute one kilogram of gold or one kilogram of platinum by something with a low carbon footprint, a carbon footprint that is as low as the one of iron or aluminum, you will have saved, made the humanity save few tons of CO2. So this is where you can have a real positive CO2 footprint with your intellectual strengths with your scientific strengths, right? So this is really important to keep in mind. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention when you speak about metals, um, you know, as metal scientists, we like to generate complex alloys, high entropy alloys sometimes uh, to make, I mean, alloying is, is, is as old as metallurgy, right? It's, it's, it's four to 5,000 uh, years old. Uh, however, when we the more we complexify metals, the more we have risk to be using a byproduct. So what you should understand is that uh, many metals are not mined for themselves. This is the case, for example, of molybdenum or iridium, which I was talking about. 
they are called byproducts. So we have molybdenum only because we have copper, because we have copper mined, and when we purify the copper, we extract the molybdenum. And when we purify the molybdenum, we have rhenium. And we produce approximately 45 to 60 tons of rhenium for 20 million tons of copper. So you understand probably where I want to, to come uh, is that when you have, uh, when you speak about byproducts, your supply offer uh, becomes strongly nonlinear. I mean, that if, you, if I take the example of rhenium, I need 45 tons of, 35 tons of rhenium I produce on earth, once again, out of 20 million tons of copper. So you understand that this 45 tons, basically it's two cubic meter, once again, something very ridiculously small. So if the demand is 20 tons and we produce 45 tons, this is not gonna affect um, the, 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 copper, uh, the copper market, right? So if we have a 20 ton demands, everything is fine. If 25, then 25, no problem. The price doesn't even change. Um, if it's 40, yeah, well, same, no problem. We produce 45 out of 20 million tons. But we could reach uh, 45 tons, um, then that's a breaking point. Because then what happens? We need 50 tons. Yes, but we produce 45. Well, the, an economist would tell you, okay, the price will rise and there will be new mines but there are no mines of, of rhenium. So if you need twice more rhenium, you need to produce twice more copper. So if you want 45 more tons of rhenium, which would be two cubic meters, you would have to produce 20 million tons of copper. And nobody is gonna do that. Uh, the copper miner will tell you, what will I do with my 20 million tons of copper that I will have to produce to give you two cubic meter of rhenium? So what's going to happen is not increase of price. Uh, what could happen virtually is that we open a mine of rhenium. Okay, that first of all, it will, it's going to take 20 years. It's going to ask take a, a lot of money, a lot of capex, and it will emit a lot of CO2 because today you extract your rhenium or your byproduct in general as a purification of the metals. But now you will have to extract a metal that is extremely rare. And that's going to generate a huge amount of CO2 because we know like for gold or platinum exploiting uh, rare metal, I mean, uh, low concentration ores is extremely CO2 intensive and energy intensive and therefore CO2 intensive. So basically, um, the magic equation of economy does not really work here. What's going to happen is a shortage. And this is terrible. This is the worst possible thing that can happen to a company. It's not increasing the price. I mean, increasing the price of a commodity, um, if you want to be safe with that, you just hire very good economists that will create a hedge fund for that. And that most of the time works because you just, you, you create financial products that can just, um, that rise when you, the price of your commodity increase and decrease when your price of your community decrease. And then you can kind of have a more or less constant price. Um, but if there is a shortage, what is the price of something that doesn't exist? Well, this is the infinity. Um, so it does not really work. And this is absolutely terrible for companies. But we are, as mature scientists, at the beginning of that change. So if we manage to create products that are more resilient, that are with less byproducts, uh, we can just very much decrease the risk associated. Well, what I'm also saying is actually not really something virtual because uh, 10 years ago, I think if I would have been speaking about shortage, everybody would have thought I'm kind of crazy. Uh, after COVID, we are a little bit more aware of that. Um, after, for example, silicon shortage that happened and uh, many of us have been affected by that if you had to buy a computer, uh, scientific equipment or something like this. Um, here is some very much more serious story about hydrogen. Uh, as you know, we are invading, uh, invading, no, investing uh, hundreds of billions of euros in the hydrogen economy. For many technologies, for example, PEM technology, we will need catalysts, which are made of platinum and platinum group metals, such as iridium. Um, the, the issue is that uh, we 
we are, we are quite likely to have a shortage in platinum fairly soon. Um, I would like to draw your attention on this graph. I mean, here is the evolution of the demand in platinum for different economical sector. So you see in blue is the platinum that is in our cars. Um, this market is supposed to decrease because, well, electric vehicles market will increase. Um, but there will be also a bigger need for hydrogen, for green hydrogen, which is hydrogen coming from water electrolysis, which is in, in green here, um, as well as in the hydrogen vehicle. And um, at the same time, the jewelry market will increase as well, and all the markets will increase so that the demand in platinum is expected to reach uh, 370 tons in 2050 for a value today of 250 approximately, I mean, a bit, yeah, 240, I would say. Um, in yellow, you have the primary production, which is from the mines, mostly in South Africa. And you see that this mining production is supposed to decrease, but the total production stays constant. So it means we bet on an increase in the recycling rate that would go from 20% all the way to 50%. This is great news for the CO2 emission. I told you one kilogram of platinum is something like 60 tons of CO2. And one kilogram of recycled platinum is one ton of CO2. So you decrease by 50. Great news for environment, right? That we uh, forecast to recycle much more platinum and gold. However, this recycling will only compensate the decrease of the mining, the mining production, the primary production, so that the total platinum available is going to stay constant, constant around 200, and the demand will increase. So the question will be, what do we want to do with our platinum? Do we want to do hydrogen or do we want to do jewels? Well, I'm afraid, I mean, we, we don't know what's going to happen. Um, we can try to invent new alloys for jewels. I'm not sure the, con the consumers will be very happy with that. I'm not sure a consumer will be happy to buy some high entropy alloy with iron, aluminum, copper, nickel, and I don't know, something else. Um, however, I think energy, um, energy industry will be happy to have catalysts made of iron, aluminum, copper, nickel, uh, or much more abundant material. So here there will be a competition between the um, the um, between the different sectors, and uh, whoever can pay more will be the one that will survive. And unfortunately, jewelry pays more than energy. That's we can be sorry about that, but this is how it is. So most probably jewelry will win and will maintain their share. And then there will be competition between chemistry, chemical industries, energy industries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Another point in this graph that is extremely important to, to mention, I told you, we need also iridium. Iridium can be used for hydrogen because it's a platinum group metals. It's quite similar in terms of chemical properties. Um, here the problem, here the fact that recycling increase is not a good news. It's definitely a terrific news, terribly bad news because um, we have iridium only because we extract platinum. But once we have extracted platinum and removed iridium, when we recycle platinum, there is no new iridium. I mean, no, no iridium has been created by some, I don't know, nuclear reaction inside of the uh, platinum. This, this doesn't happen. So the decrease in the mining, uh, the primary production of platinum will also reduce the production of iridium rhodium, osmium, uh, palladium, uh, and, and all the byproducts. And that might be a big issue. I mean, so we should also take it into account. So we should very much recycle iridium, even more than platinum, actually, because there are mine of platinum, there are no mine of iridium. Iridium is just extracted out of platinum, just to, that, to keep that in care. So this is a real, this is not a 1 million euro question. This is a few hundreds billion euro question. Uh, because this is approximately what we invest uh, in, in the different continents in the hydrogen economy. So here there is a really huge um, topic for young material scientists who are interested in doing sustainable materials by design. Can we design new catalysts? 
for sustainable hydrogen economy. So um, it's, it's important also to reduce, um, you know, exposition to conflict um, because, well, once again, platinum is produced mostly in two countries, which are South Africa and uh, in Norilsk in, in, in Russia. Um, so far, Europe is not super friendly with Russia. And uh, South Africa had clearly told to the European uh, Union that their geopolitic strategy is more with the BRICS than with the USA and Europe. This is just a fact, and we have to cope with that. We will not be the first who will be served. As painful as it is, this is um, the reality. So there are really urgent needs uh, here. This is the, 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 the hottest topic of sustainable materials by design right now. Um, so what can we do? I mean, uh, first, we should discover new materials and we should assess what we do. This is new practice that we should really implement in material science. And of course, we have to do it fast uh, because we have no time. You see, the shortage is coming in a few years, unfortunately. Um, well, good news is that we have choice. Um, AI is, is, is helping us a lot. So I'm going to show you just different um, examples. So there are new tools that can tell you all the materials that have been found by scientific community. This is, for example, Chem Data Extractor. This is developed at the University of Cambridge by Jackie, Jackie Cole. So this is just an example with semiconductors. Uh, her software extracted the 7,000 semiconductors. So this is a number. I didn't know how many semiconductors have been discovered by humans. Well, 7,000. I mean, it was, I didn't know this number. And there is this, uh, this the, the band gap available. So this is the, the amount of choice you have if you want to, to, to substitute a semiconductor. Um, here is another approach based, there's no AI here, it's only calculation, quantum calculation, DFT, for those who are familiar with that. Um, so here is a database of 658,000 alloys called uh, multi-principle elements. Um, here is another paper published in Nature uh, when um, it's, it's, a, it's a startup from, uh, from Google um, who, who, who developed some AI model to discover materials. They published 2.2 million materials. Sounds huge. And then I just did a very simple calculation to say how many combinations are actually possible. And uh, if you take five elements, uh, atoms with a 1% compositional step, so you just vary the ratio 1% by 1%, then you end up with 10 to the power 12 possible alloys. This is the number of galaxies in the universe. And if you want to make 10 elements alloy, um, you end up with 10 to the power 24, which is the number of stars in the universe, right? So you can continue. So the amount of possible materials, possible alloys is huge. And this is always a funny question because the, when you speak with journalists about this, they say, oh, you discover new materials and they, they have the feeling like this is a new element. No, there's no new chemical elements, but just there are plenty of possible materials. And then when I say there are as many materials as number of stars in the universe, they usually don't believe it. Um, so this is basically what we have to explore. So I think there are room for our career, right? The, 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 the field is not drying on, I mean, so soon. Uh, but the problem here is absolutely different. Like how can we explore it recently? Um, efficiently. So a lot of hope with AI here. Um, and the question is like, will I be, will we be workless if we do uh, experiment because we'll be replaced by AI? Well, you know, is it the end of story? Well, um, I did just a, a simple experiment. I simplified, I just put materials A and B. I'm happy to discuss in more detail this. So it was in the field of high entropy alloys and uh, a lot of paper claim that they could predict what will be high entropy alloy and what would not be. So we just run those codes. And yes, this is true. AI can reach 90% uh, accuracy to predict what is a high entropy alloy and what is not based on an experimental database. So we thought, well, this is quite good. I mean, I, I, I fail much more than the AI. So AI is really overcoming, uh, overpassing us. Uh, but the problem was that when we analyzed the results, we understood that basically we have been exploring a very, very tiny part of the parameter space. So it's basically like we've been 
to the moon, right? We explored one alloy mostly and its satellite alloys. And when this new database of 6,508,000 ,005 materials has been published, we were surprised that actually the, the, the balance between materials A and B, so high entropy alloys and non-high non entropy alloys, was completely different. We had only 5% um, of high entropy alloys. And here, the accuracy was 95%. So still, if you just look at this, you feel like AI is doing it super well because 95% um, is very good. Well, then you need to ask the very bad students of your class how they do when they have a questions with true and false. And if you tell them that 95% of the answers will be true, they will say that, or false, sorry, they will say that everything is false and their mark will be 95%. And this is exactly what the AI is doing. If 95% of the materials is not high entropy alloys, they are going to predict that high entropy alloy do not exist. And they will be 95% of the time true. It's just like saying the space is 99% empty. It means that the space is vacuum. It means that stars do not exist. Planets do not exist. Life do not exist. 99% of the time, this is going to be true. But this is scientific fault. So this is where AI, we should be very careful with that type of set. And we demonstrated that by trying to learn from one set, an experimental set, and try to predict a theoretical one. And then you just definitely show that with the existing data, AI cannot basically be efficient. And the problem is in the data. The problem is not in AI. AI works well. The algorithms are good. But if you want to make AI fail, you just need to send wrong data. This is what hackers are doing now. They are not hacking the systems. They are just sending wrong data. This is the most efficient way to make AI become crazy. So if you take the reverse problem, you say, if we want AI to be very efficient, we should be extremely careful. We should rethink the way we do our data set. And we need to understand when we usually do science, we have one resource that work, and then we are going to explore the satellites results, right? If I have an alloy, for example, that is fantastic, that is iron, aluminum, copper, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take iron, aluminum, and I will change a metal by not copper, but nickel, like a, because this is the neighbor element. Well, this is very good for, for in our way to do science, but this is extremely bad for AI because you concentrate the results in one very tiny part of the parameter space. So this is really... Um, what the way we should change our mindset to explore very much different uh, direction at the same time. And in parallel, we should, if we do this type of risky experiment, we should definitely assess the sustainability at the same time. So we developed this type of small simulator here. I don't know if it works. Okay, there's no video here. But here you can write a um, chemical uh, formula of your alloy and you will get some sustainability indicators such as a CO2 footprint, the supply risk, um, the maximum market you can target with your um, with your metal, uh, with your alloy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So to graphically um, summarize this talk um, in alloys, this is what we have explored. Uh, this is what we should explore if we want to do uh, artificial intelligence and explore. So we should very much change our mindset for exploration to go in many directions at the same time and just within this possible direction select the most sustainable ones with the principle I've been given at the beginning. So I believe just the message I want to send is that we material scientists, we are at the beginning of the chain. Is We are saying which materials are important for which application. And this will generate the demand and the demand will generate the mining or the recycling. So we are at the very beginning. So if we generate ideas, materials that are soliciting cleaner materials, I mean, there will be less incentive to extract the most polluting materials. So we will we should really have it in mind and, and, and take it into account. And that basically will generate a lot of fundamental questions, a lot of exciting science 
um, and also very useful um, in general. So really, metallurgy sounds like old science sometimes to some people, but I really want to say this is really uh, the science of the future uh, right now. So I'd like to just uh, mention, this is very important for me, that uh, we, we never do anything alone. So this is just uh, our team who is based in different country, um, France and Slovenia, also uh, in, in uh, Mohammed VI University in Morocco. Um, and uh, basically, if you want to know more about what we've done, we have a, we have a paper currently, uh, a manuscript available in, 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 uh, in Nature Communications in reviewing. You can follow our Heroes Project on LinkedIn or on YouTube. We have a podcast, etc. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, yeah, happy to respond to any questions, should there be any.